on town meeting. This allegedly shows an autopsy being performed on an alien by military doctors in 1947. Is this legitimate or a hoax? An English filmmaker claims a retired U.S. military cameraman sold him this film. Critics say it's a fraud and that there are too many details that are wrong. If it's real, then our government has been covering up contact with alien civilizations for 50 years. Tonight on Town Meeting, see it, hear about it, then decide. The alien autopsy, reality or hoax? Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight on Town Meeting. You know, the uh, film we're about to see has its champions and it has its critics. There are those who say it offers definitive proof, absolutely definitive proof, that extraterrestrials have been visiting Earth, that the U.S. government has long known this and has been deeply involved in a concerted effort to cover that fact up. Others question the film's authenticity and suggest it is part of an elaborate hoax. In a moment, we are going to talk with the man who took the film public earlier this year. But first, a glimpse of the film said to have been shot almost 50 years ago. Pictures of what is said to be a deceased extraterrestrial about to be autopsied by U.S. military doctors. All right, joining us now via satellite from London, the British filmmaker and production company owner who took this film public. Please join me in welcoming Ray Santilli. I uh, very much, very much appreciate you joining us this evening, Ray. Let me, let me give a quick and uh, I hope accurate synopsis. You were in the United States conducting business ran across an individual who claims to have shot the footage, uh, a portion of which we have just seen, correct? Yes, okay. that's correct. So, I, I, and how did this come up? I mean, I'm sure you weren't sitting down and, and he went, hey, hey you want to see an autopsy of an alien? <laughs> I mean, I, I, and I don't mean to be facetious, but how did the conversation evolve to the point where you obtained a copy of this film? Okay, um, firstly, in your introduction, you um, uh, labeled me as a, as a film producer. That's not technically correct. Um, since I left school, I've always been involved in music uh, and in the music industry. And um, it just so happened that in 1992, we did decide to get involved in uh, music documentary making, if you like. Okay, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll stand technically corrected. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and... and, and, and um, and give you the perhaps I, I misdescribed your, your avocation. But, but if you okay. will, because you know, I'm trying to get to the point of, of where you obtained the footage and, and under what circumstances. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was in Cleveland in 1992, and uh, the reason for being in Cleveland was that um, I was working on a music documentary. We were looking for uh, footage of early rock and roll stars, and I traveled out there to meet uh, a DJ that uh, um, in the uh, 50s was involved in the early rock and roll scene and I had parked myself and uh, my associates in uh, one of the hotels at Cleveland and while we were there uh, we made it known to the music community, the fans of people like Elvis Presley and Pat Boone and so forth that we would be in that area and that uh, we wanted to buy memorabilia, uh, photographs, uh, autographs, film footage, anything that related to the early rock and roll stars of the 50s and um, I was in Cleveland for over a week, and during that time I met uh, numerous people, all of which um, were fans or uh, owners of, memor uh, fans of artists and people that had memorabilia relating to early rock and roll stars. And, um, tie, tie this almost... in for me, though. Tie this into the alien. I'm, 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 I'm just kind of wondering where you're going here. Well, allow me to finish. Okay. And um, what had happened was that uh, one person uh, came to see me, with some early footage, uh, as I said, music footage, and um, we purchased some music footage from this person. He explained to, to me that in the mid-50s he worked for Universal News as a, a freelance cameraman, and um, after we concluded the arrangement for that piece of footage that we purchased off him, he started talking about what he was doing prior to 1952, and uh, he just said to me, look, you know, would you be interested in something else? And then he started explaining that Prior to 1952, he worked for the military, 
and that uh, he had calls to go to White Sands, New Mexico, and that he filmed an aviation crash, and that he filmed uh, the autopsy of something that, uh, that I would find you know, very interesting. And, um, and, 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 uh, and I got to wonder, I, I'm curious because, you know, your reaction, <clears throat> you're either thinking this guy is either a total Looney Tune or really. he has given, given me access to something that is poten potentially earth shattering, no pun intended. Um, well, I haven't got to that stage yet. Um, if you've, you've asked the story, so I'm, I'm still at the early stages. So um, during my first meeting with the cameraman, um, you know, you know immediately when, when you meet someone whether you believe that they're genuine. This guy was in his 80s. He's just an ordinary, bog standard, middle American. Um, he obviously didn't have a great deal of money, but he, was, uh, uh, he appeared to be normal. I had immediate faith in him as being genuine. And, um, you know, when he explained the story, he said, well, would you like to come and see it? And I thought, well, there's nothing to lose. I've, you know, traveled 2,000 miles to, to buy some music footage. If, if he's got something else that's, 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 that's worth looking at, then, I, I, of course, I would be interested. Um, and to cut a, a long story short, I eventually uh, traveled to his house. I met his family. I, I saw the way he lived. I could see, you know, the memorabilia that he has in his house, the photographs on the wall. I could see, you know, that the person was genuine. He, he, he was in the military. He, he is who he said he was at that time. And um, when I first saw the footage, uh, then... The this was on a projector in his home? He yeah, set up a projector computer. in his yeah, home yeah. and showed you the footage. Yeah. And your yeah. first and immediate reaction? Well, well, confusion, I, I, because the guy, the guy was genuine, there's no question about that. The footage was sensational, but what was it? And you know, the, the problem that I had is that at the time is that I had no experience uh, with regard to UFOs, the paranormal, or anything like that. And um, it was totally outside of my field. Uh, but however, you know, I'm not going to turn down an, an opportunity if, if, if there was a possibility of coming away with a piece of what, footage like that. What this. were the first frames that you saw, Ray? I mean, what, was it what we have seen? I mean, was it the, the yeah. alien lying on a table? Because I understand there are other uh, images yeah, that have yet to be publicly shown. That's right. uh, the crash yeah. site and, and uh, a lot of other things as mm. described by uh, those who have talked with you earlier. Yeah, uh, the first footage that uh, I saw was uh, the same footage which has now been publicly uh, released. Okay, um, is that in your mind the most convincing or is it the best or no. is it only a portion of what there might are, be forthcoming? There are two autopsies um, and uh, the two autopsies are much the same as the one that you've already seen. And um, in addition to that there's, um, uh, there's some debris footage and there's a whole lot of scrap footage which uh, all came as part of the pack that we took away. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating film, it's interesting. Um, and when I first saw the film, obviously I wanted to buy it. Um, and I think it was easy for the cameraman to talk to me. Um, I'm English, he's American, and, uh, you know, as far as he was concerned at that time, there's no real comeback. You know, it's just a question of uh, he could part with some film for some cash, and it was a, an easy deal. He felt comfortable with it. Why, and, why Ray Santilli? Why, why after almost, uh, well, roughly 45 years, why after all this time that this man, uh, you know, uh, reportedly held on to this footage, why Ray Santilli? Why not Peter Jennings? Why not Steven Spielberg? Because I wasn't there looking for it. It was, it was just in the right place at the right time. Had I been involved in the UFO community, had I been involved in research, had I been, you know, someone that was actively seeking out this kind of footage, I probably would never have found it. You know, I, I, was, uh, I was involved in a completely different subject at the time. And, uh, you know, as I said to you earlier, when he first mentioned what he had, I mean, I, I had no knowledge of the subject. In fact, the very first thing that I did was I called um, the head of the British UFO organization over here, um, a guy called Philip Mantle, and uh, I asked him to explain what Roswell was and, um, you know, what happened at the time. I had to educate myself very quickly on the subject. All right, let, let's, um, if we can, let me, let me put up a, a freeze frame of some of what we've seen already. Let's everybody take another look and... and because uh, we only showed a quick glimpse of the of the movie itself, so let me. What do we got here? Who who wants to comment on on what they're seeing? You. I actually, to be honest, I just reviewed the uh, video of the movie release Roswell, the uh, UFO cover up, 
And in that movie, it uh, shows quite a bit of detail. Of course, it's prefabricated. It's not the... Yeah, but talk to me about this, and we may get to the Roswell movie later, but... This stirs me because um, I have a lot of belief in this subject, as well as others, that we tend to have the scientific community uh, take away from us, or as the government as well. And I can't uh, take that as not being evident that there is definitely something for our curiosity, for us to investigate. I believe it's genuine. Oh, totally. Oh, hi, Ken. Hi. Ken, I, I want to open up just by saying here that, that this is the 90s. There's no mass hysteria involved here. This, everybody knows this happened. Everybody's aware. So, so why are they still stonewalling us from the governmental and military standpoint? What's well, well, you've taken a great leap here. And, but let me ask you, and it may be a superfluous question. Anybody who wears a Star Trek communicators button <laughs> on his shirt... <laughs> it, it, it may be a superfluous question to ask you whether you feel the film that we're looking at and have talked about here is genuine. Oh, absolutely. Okay. A anybody who doesn't, anyone who sits there and, and questions either the veracity of the story that we've heard, oh boy, a whole audience full of just... I know there's a lot of people that are going to disagree with me here, but I think it's a marvelous addition to the body of UFO folklore. I really do. I've... Uh, uh, become fascinated with uh, UFO subjects in the last few year, years uh, in regards to folklore, um, especially since reading a book recently that the Seattle Public Library has called uh, "Watch the Skies," which approaches this from a you know a, to me is a what to me is a totally new new way of looking at it. All right. let, let me go back to Mr. Santilli here because I don't want to get too diverted. I'll come back to you with the book if I have a chance. But I mean, this isn't. I mean, you've been. This has been greeted with skepticism. You have had. I, I know contact with uh, various pathologists. We're going to talk with them later. We've got some skeptics here in our audience and some other supporters that we'll speak to as the show progresses here. But but to your skeptics, you say what, Ray Santilli? Um, very little I can say really. I offer the film for investigation and and uh, you know people have to draw their own conclusions you know what I would say is that by now millions of dollars worldwide has been spent on investigating the film and the film still maintains its integrity uh, most uh, pathologists and medical experts that see the film uh, are satisfied that it's flesh and blood and you know when you get the people that make Jurassic Park say that they don't think it's a special effect you're only left with one other conclusion so, you know, people are entitled to their own opinion. If they, if they think that the, the, the film um, is not genuine, then there's nothing I can do to convince them. Have you in shown... Fact, to be honest, and to be honest, I don't really care. You know, I, I, the film is out there. Um, I'm not a great lover of the subject of UFOs, and I have no experience of the paranormal, but, you know, the film is out there. Um, you've got some of, the, some of the best scientific brains in the world examining it. So whatever it is, then whatever it is, it is. All right, a technical question, Mr. Santilli here. I mean, is it, are they examining the film or are they examining a videotape copy of the film? A variety. Um, since we started this, uh, we've given frames of film to a variety of different people. And in fact, there isn't a week that goes by when I don't get maybe 10, 20 different requests coming into my office for people, I, uh, from people asking for clips of film. Um, and if we carried on servicing uh, bits of film to everyone that asks, we'd have nothing left by now. <laughs> so, you know, we're now down to the stage where, you know, where we have the critical image left, but everything else has been farmed out to just about everyone that's asked. All right, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some additional footage of what's described as the actual autopsy doctors performed on the alien. We're going to meet a guy who says, hey, this is, this is, this is great, but it's, it's a great hoax. And we will meet someone also who had the highest national security clearance available in this country. He's a retired military guy, and he says this isn't the only alien autopsy performed by the United States government. Stay with us. We'll be back.
Hey, I thank you kindly for hanging around with us. This is Town Meeting, and we are talking about the uh, now well-known alien autopsy film. And we have as a guest Ray Santilli, who is the gentleman from uh, Great Britain who introduced the, uh, this film to the world. Let me, let me ask you, Ray, uh, there are those who say this is a remarkable find. There are those who say this is a remarkable hoax. You seem n uncompelled to convince people either way. Um, it's been a very long, hard road, and um, I really can't do anything more than that I've already done. And the film's out there now, and as I said earlier, lots of money's been spent on investigating it, and there's nothing more I can offer the public. You know, that's the film. You, you've come to conclude, and, and I, I don't think I'm mistaking or misstating you, but you, you've come to conclude that many of the technological uh, advancements that have occurred over the past several decades are probably a direct result of the ongoing contact that the U.S. and other countries perhaps have had with extraterrestrials? Um, that's not my conclusion, but the cameraman believes that uh, okay. digital technology, fiber optics, and uh, a great deal of what we enjoy now comes from the technology that, uh, that, uh, that the Americans recovered from these vehicles. Okay. Let, let me introduce here real quickly Robert Dean, who is a retired command sergeant major. Uh, he was stationed at uh, NATO headquarters in 1963, had one of the highest clearances uh, available to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, an enlisted man or even an officer, Hello. Robert Dean. Yes. Um, had access to NATO observances and studies, U.S. studies of UFOs and, and extraterrestrial incidents. That's correct. Your conclusion of the film. About the film? Yeah. My jury is still out on the Santilli film. I won't really reach a final conclusion until I've had a chance to sit down and talk to Jack Barnett, oh. who apparently is the cameraman. I, uh, I'm a skeptic, and I, I've tried to be skeptical in this subject for many, many years. The film does not upset me too much because I have seen photographs and other film of other autopsies, which are similar. So there is a good chance that this is very well legitimate, that this film is real. But I don't jump to these conclusions until I've like looked at a lot more information. And I haven't met Mr. Barnett. I haven't ever had the pleasure to meet Mr. Santilli. So my jury is still out. Where did, this other, where did these other films that you make reference to come from? You've got to understand that I spent 27 years in the military. I spent 14 years working for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And I'm not here this evening to either defend or attack Mr. Santilli's film. I'm here to tell you that the UFO matter is real. It's been real. We've known it for 50 years. The government has indeed covered it up. And one of the things that I've been devoting my life to in the last few years is to try to get the secret out, to try to get the American government to level with the American people and tell them the truth in this matter. Thank you. Yeah. What you perceive what you perceive is the motive for the government not wanting to, as you term it, let the American public know the truth is what? You have what? to go back. This is a historical problem. We have to go back 50 years and realize that the first decision that was made to keep the lid on this back in the very beginning, and we're not going back to just 1947. We've got evidence that this thing goes back a hell of a lot farther than 1947. The first decision to keep the lid on this was made as a result of fear. It was a military decision made as a result at the end of World War II. We were beginning to go into the Cold War. There was a fear factor here. They really didn't want, they didn't know how the American people could deal with this reality. And uh, so that was a decision that they made. If, if you've seen other autopsy films, how come I haven't seen other autopsy films? Well, you haven't been in the right place in the right time. Where, where is the right To give place? you an example, I, I, I came into this whole field through the back door, you might say. I, I was a skeptic, and I've told Mr. Schaefer here, I began as a skeptic. I was a professional soldier for 27 years of my life. I went to Shape headquarters in 1963, and for the first time in my life, I saw a study that was underway. I was there when it was published in 1964. For the first time in my life, it dawned on me I could see firsthand that this was a reality. This was not science fiction. This was not fantasy. My God, this was real. The implications on this matter were so damn far-fetching, so far beyond anything I had ever thought of before. And that experience in 1964, when it was published, 
literally turn, turn my life around. Okay, let me, if we may, I, wa I want to look uh, again <clears throat> at a brief glimpse of the, of the film we're talking about, which has been made available by Ray Santini. We'll take a, a quick look at that, and then I'm going to introduce Robert Schaefer, who is with the Committee for the Scientific, Scientific Investigation of the uh, Paranormal. And, and ask you, Mr. Schaefer, to be looking at this. And, I mean, I know you've seen portions or this film in its entirety. Um, what, what's your thoughts on this? Well, I, I have to uh, beg to differ from um, what Mr. Santilli said in uh, quite a number of uh, ways. Uh, he said a lot of money has been spent on uh, investigating this film. I doubt seriously if that's true. What is true, however, is that a lot of money has been made by selling this film and selling the rights to... TV stations and to other media outlets around the world. So he says he doesn't care whether we believe it or not as long as those checks keep rolling in for those licensing on that thing. I really think that's what the motive is here. And um, me, he keeps changing I, uh, his story about where he got the film and exactly how. Uh, at first it was, well, this guy Barnett, uh, he, got, he had both this old Elvis, Elvis footage and the uh, autopsy film, then when he was interviewed, when Mr. Santilli was interviewed on French TV a couple weeks ago, they had some proof that that wasn't correct, that he'd got these Elvis footage from a DJ in uh, Cleveland by the name of uh, Bill Randall, I think it was, and uh, then the story changed again a little bit, and then this guy Barnett just somehow found him out of the blue in uh, Cleveland, and... Uh, uh, so you look at this, you look at what we've been looking at, what we've been seeing, and, and you would deem it a very clever, well-produced... Well, it's a fairly uh, sophisticated hoax, but it's clearly, it is a hoax for a number of reasons, uh, some of which we're getting into. Uh, uh, among them, uh, that, that some people are claiming that this is such a remarkable dummy that it, you know, or, or I mean a remarkable, it would have to be such a remarkable dummy that it couldn't be done except by the very best special effects people, but others disagree. Uh, the guy who did the uh, special effects with dummies for the movie, uh, the Showtime movie on Roswell, he looks at it and he says of this so-called autopsy film that it is a, a dummy and it's not even a particularly good one. All right, let me get so. Mr. Santilli in because I heard you uh, make reference to wanting to respond. I want to give you the opportunity. Go ahead, Ray. Um, just talking about the broadcast aspect, um, in many territories the film has been given free of charge to broadcasters in order for them to investigate. Yes, it has been licensed to other territories, but if you're talking about uh, in terms of financial gain, at the moment, that has not occurred. Um, you and not if the made film proves money off this? No, I've not, I've not said that we've not made any money, because of course we have made some money. But um, we are not into any kind of profit, and we won't be until the film is proved to be genuine. Okay, let's get um, to one of the audience members. As Let me ask, maybe uh, I make a question or comment here. If this is a hoax, <laughs> it's a very poorly done hoax. If I wanted to hoax something like this, I think that. <clears throat> I could go anywhere to Hollywood and come up with a hell of a much better hoax than what I see here on this Santilli film. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to know uh, two short issues real quickly. How many rolls of film did you purchase that you still have? And why is it that either the right tests haven't been done yet to determine their authenticity forensically? Because I've been and do assist police agencies all across the country in forensic types of evidence, and I study it myself including photographically, and it seems to me that if all the roles were turned over to Kodak or the right scientist, by now we'd have a verdict. Well, film has been, sorry, film has been given um, to various different broadcasters and uh, uh, institutions to, uh, to investigate. Um, they all conduct their own tests and, you know, whatever conclusions they draw. But, Ray, uh, I think uh, he was asking specifically about the offer made by Kodak, which, you know, they have said, you know, give us a, a small portion of a frame or two of this film, we can determine whether it is, you know, from that particular era of stock. Uh, they can, yeah. you know, a lot of things. And from what I understand, Kodak has not received the film that they've requested. Right. Nobody has really seen the original on this, except maybe Mr. Santilli. Everybody else just sees these um, <coughs> video copies of it. Well, your information is incorrect. Film has been given. Well, it's um, a little, little two-inch piece of blank leader. No, not at all. Fil film, film with image and not leader tape has been given. And um, uh, Fox home. and Bob, Bob Shell, who's an independent um, film expert for um, Kodak, has film. Um, the film has been given to the English broadcasters, to the French broadcasters. Film has been given. And um, as I said to you before, 
we get requests in all the time, and if we keep giving away a film, there will soon be very little of it left. All right, let me get to one of the audience members here, because I, I know we could continue the debate and, and the uh, ensuing questioning amongst the upfronters here, but I also want to involve the audience. Yeah, I'd like to critique the film as I saw it last spring. As a physician, I've dissected frogs, pigs, and I spent months dissecting <clears throat> a cadaver. There are several flaws in that film. First off, it's inconceivable that they would take an alien and just carve them up in half an hour or an hour. I spent months as a med student on one body to learn every piece of it. So would our Air Force scientists. No body I'm ever familiar with has organs just dumped in it like an empty drawer that one just simply lifts out without tedious dissection of fascial planes and the what have you. There are connections. Right, and nobody's even noting where these organs come from. They just kind of pull them out and stick them down. <laughs> Yeah, something this serious demands a careful scribe in that room. So you're saying, as a physician, you're looking at this from a medical perspective, and we'll speak later, by the way, to a, a, a nationally recognized pathologist who says, hey, he's watched this thing and, and he thinks it's for real. But you think, no. No. Yeah, simple. Uh, can I make a point? This sure. Is, this is not an autopsy. Okay. This is a dissection. Okay. An autopsy would be a lot more scientific. It would take a hell of a lot more time. They would devote much, much more detail. But, but you have to acknowledge that the point that he makes, in, and, and I'll get you in on this as well, Ray, the point that he makes is a fairly valid one, that if you no. had uh, uh, an alien being that you were studying, you would not, in a <clears throat> haphazard fashion, take your Boy Scout penknife, begin slicing and jerking stuff out of there. Okay. Firstly, I didn't see a Boy, a boy Scout uh, penknife. I, I saw a scalpel. Okay. Uh, the, okay. other thing, the, the other thing that I would like to make is, the other point is that uh, um, the gentleman that said that the, the autopsy took place in half an hour or, or two hours, he, he has information that no one else has because no one knows how long the autopsy took. All we have are a few reels of film from the autopsy. The autopsy itself could have taken a week, a month, it could have taken a year, but we only have a few reels. So you can't say that the entire autopsy took place in, in, in half an hour or two hours. We just yeah. don't know. Point, point, counterpoint. Okay, hold on. Uh, when we come back, you know, we're going to look at some pictures that are said to have been taken by U.S. astronauts, images that, that some insist NASA and the U.S. government never wanted us to see. When we come back, take a look. Scout knife. Thank you kindly for staying with us here on Tom Meeting. We are talking with Ray Santilli. He is the gentleman who introduced the, the uh, I, I guess you can term it, famous footage of what's been described as an alien autopsy conducted by U.S. doctors in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, part of uh, 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 what some believe is a conspiracy by the government to cover up uh, what was uh, an alien extraterrestrial spacecraft that crashed there. Mr. Santilli, one of the things that uh, we were talking about during the break here that people are very interested in knowing, how many reels of film do you have? Uh, I acquired 22 reels off the cameraman. Um, unfortunately, not all of the reels contained image, and, um, which, is, which has meant that uh, uh, the, the length of viewable footage we have doesn't relate to the number of reels that we have. All right, let me ask you this then. Of the footage we've seen, how much remains that we could see that has yet to be released? I mean, have we seen 10 percent, 30 percent, 90 percent? Well, there's, there's one further autopsy, um, and there's debris footage. Um, to be honest, I don't know what the ratio is, um, but there is, a, there is certainly another autopsy, and there is debris footage as well. 
and, uh, and, so, and as I said earlier, some scrap footage. But uh, approximate guess, I'd say you, you, you've seen maybe 40 to 50 percent of what there is. All right, let's, let's uh, again, we'll take a look, a, pre a brief glimpse at some of the footage that we're talking about. And by the way, this has been scrutinized by people who went and checked out and said, hey, look at the stretch cord on the phone. Yeah, that was available in 1947. Ballpoint pens, available in 1947. The clock on the wall, verified, as far as I know, as available in 1947. So Not the telephone. There's a problem with the telephone. <clears throat> the cord. From what I hear, what, well, from what I heard, is AT&T said, yes, it well, was available to the military. There's, in there's, a, there's a, a reference book, uh, Once Upon a Telephone, that's a history of the telephone, says that that particular, that the wall telephone, as we see it there, was not introduced until 1956. Any but not for the military. See, that's, well, I heard there's, where, the, and, and I'm nobody, not trying to. Again, the claim is made. No one has ever shown any document, any book, any reference of any kind. They just say, sure, the military had it. Find me a World War II photograph or book or document of some kind that shows that kind of telephone existing in 1947 or before. Nobody's that come up with anything. They say, done. well, there were coiled telephone cords. Maybe there were coiled telephone cords somewhere, but there were no wall-mounted telephones with coiled telephone cords, and especially not with that type of dial and so on. See, I thought the TV show Star Trek playing in the background was a more definitive... That <laughs> probably is. Uh, this kind of quibbling <laughs> really is getting us nowhere. I would like to ask Mr. Santilli. Let me, I'll like tell you what. I Bob, like hold on. Break. Before before I go to you, Bob, let me. We have uh, Cyril. Uh, pronounce help pronounce your last name with me here, Cyril, Doctor. Weck. Doctor Cyril Weck, who is uh, a, a nationally renowned pathologist. He has looked at this and counter to what our physician over on the other side of the audience has to say. Your your point on this, Doctor Weck. My point was simply uh, could be uh, one of three or four things. Could be. Um a uh, a well uh, designed uh, magnificent uh, hoax it could be a person who has been subjected to um, radiation in one of the illicit radiation experiments that the government uh, was conducting around that time it could be someone who uh, had some congenital uh, anomalies and uh, other medical problems and there could be a combination of those two, someone who had some medical problems and who has been subjected to a radiation, possibly even uh, with the idea in mind of uh, such treatment being therapeutic, uh, or maybe somebody um, being subjected to a radiation who was ill uh, and being used as a kind of a medical cannon fodder, something like uh, black men were uh, at the uh, Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiment over a period of many years. Uh, or it could be something that is inexplicable uh, that we have not seen the likes of. So those are the possibilities. All right, let me ask you, Dr. Wecht, if somebody sat you in a chair in a room and said, you're not getting out of here until you tell me which way you're leaning. My answer would be the same. I uh, feel that it's up to uh, people uh, who are involved in this uh, matter for a variety of reasons, uh, commercial, uh, avocational, uh, uh, whatever, uh, to pursue uh, various leads. I've just heard a little bit of your discussion over the past couple of minutes, uh, such things as the telephone or so on. I must say, and, and I don't know the answer to the telephone observation, but I find it hard to believe that someone who is so brilliant and has uh, such an incredibly Machiavellian mind and goes to the trouble of setting the stage um, to uh, make it appear that this is uh, an alien uh, would fail to notice that the phone is an anachronism. Reminds me of an old joke which goes on for about 10 minutes to about 15 and 10 seconds of a, of a Jewish guy 50 years ago who wanted to go to the New York Athletic Club when they didn't take Jews, and he studied for, for years uh, uh, everything, what kind of house to live in, what kind of roof to have, what kind of bridge to play, what kind of sailboat to sail. He goes to a four-hour interview. He mashes it all. At the end, they say, by the way, what's your religion? He says, Jewish. He, you know, he blew the whole thing uh, in, in one second. It reminds me, so somebody's going to go to this kind of a... Of so a you're saying if the detail... If, then if, they're going to fail to note the telephone on the wall. That, that, that admittedly is, not, a, is not, not scientific proof, but I find it kind of hard to believe that somebody would... Uh, that, that's, that's, that's almost a Saturday Night Live skit. All right, let me, <laughs> let me ask, because I think what we've had layered here over a period of years is, is anecdotal information, <laughs> Uh, unsubstantiated sightings, pictures of poor quality, blurry images that appear to be, 
you know, frisbees flying through the air, some with uh, other degrees of clarity that seem to be authentic, and yet there has been nothing definitive. And, and as we fold this in, and I'll, I'll ask this of Robert Schaefer, what is it that would convince you in your mind as to the authenticity of this film? If there was one thing that could be proven, what would it be? Well, it's hard to say having just seen this little thing. I mean, if, if somebody could, could uh, come up with some, something that, that what, it would look a lot more plausible uh, if, you know, it really had internal organs rather than just jello there. And I can't see how Dr. Weck's uh, conclusion could possibly be correct that this could be somebody born with a congenital deformity such that their internal organs are all scrambled up. Uh, you couldn't, you couldn't, life isn't possible like right. that. I, I and, mentioned... Uh, I, and so, uh, I'm, I'm saying it would, it would have a lot more credibility if it looked like... I would like to know if you would this. believe it if an alien came and knocked on your front door. Well, then I'd get a picture of them, and then we'd have at least a little something. It's more than what we have here. But an awful lot of people have like an awful to, lot like of information and in details. of the film in the hands of a real scientific agency, uh, rather than this, uh, when Mr. Santilli claims... Let, let me, because you mentioned pictures, I, I want to kind of move us at least into another area that can further the discussion or, or shift the attention. You, you have uh, submitted to us some pictures uh, taken by NASA photographs. NASA photographs. Mm -hmm. These are purportedly taken by U.S. astronauts during Apollo missions? Apollo missions. Okay, what's this that we're looking at? Right over here to you. To that you, was to a you. Uh, mission taken near the moon. I believe it was Apollo 11, if I'm not mistaken. You have the numbers on it. Okay. And how do we know it's authentic? Well, how do we know? <laughs> the point I'm making the is that I obtained these photographs through the Japanese. Now, you how did the Japanese, Japanese get them? Yeah. What? Yeah. Some, Japan somebody in Japan? What? Some editor? Some uh, hoaxer? Who okay, knows? hold on. To a skeptic, no evidence at all will be sufficient. And that's what we have. But, no, evidence at all. And, <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. Just give me a credit me for a moment. Skepticism there, there is, is healthy, but how did There is an enormous amount of evidence available out there which you have never seen. Exactly. And there is an enormous amount of evidence that has been purposely kept from you. But there is an indeed another body of evidence that is available to anybody who takes the time and trouble to look at it. And one of the things that I've been yelling about for the last five years is that most skeptics have never, ever really looked at the evidence. And my friend... I'm looking at this right no, now. certainly not. No. Let me... Let, this... All right, rather this, than... This I, I, shot, I, hold on, hold on. Rather this than let shot. you engage in a one-on-one -on -one conversation <laughs> while the rest of us sit here and listen... Oh, I, I bear, we were, yeah, we were. We this were shot happens to have an identification number. It has a roll number of the film. It has a Kodak number. This was taken by one of your astronauts near the moon. How did you get it? Real I got quickly, it from a Japanese a publisher who is using this information to put together the biggest museum that's ever but been built. But how did the Japanese how, how publisher get it? The United States government gave it to them. Well, if they're hiding it, why did they give it to them? Because they want it out, but they don't want it out in a blunt, shocking kind of way. So they don't, instead of giving it to one of the news agencies, they give it to this Japanese guy and they say, you no, put this, this in your museum not a, and then this you is give not, it to Robert This Dean. is not a Japanese guy. This is well, the Prime Minister is. of Japan, for oh, God's sake. they gave it to the Prime Minister of Japan. Has the Japanese embassy confirmed Well, what I can see, you know what happens here. I don't know if this happens to Donahue, but I've lost control. Let, let me tell you something. Uh, I've got... I've got to take a break. I want to thank Dr. Cyril Wack for joining us and, and adding here. And I know you have to go, so I appreciate your contribution here. Right, when we come you. back, the question, here's another question. We'll continue discussing the photos. We'll look at other photos that Bob has brought with him, and we will talk whether or not there has been, discuss, whether or not there's been an increase in Northwest UFO sightings over the past few months. Stay with us. They're silvery. They look like they're turning in the sun. They're very high in the sky, and what's amazing is they're not moving. But there's four of them. I...
Thank you for staying with us. We're talking with uh, Ray Santilli, who's the gentleman who introduced the film, now referred to as The Alien Autopsy to the World. We have Robert Schaefer, who's... Uh, how, how about if I just abbreviate and say you're skeptical? And, 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 and Bob Dean, who is a former command sergeant major with the military and uh, served in NATO in Europe, and he says he's got pictures. We were dis discussing some of the photos that you say were made available. Let, I want to look at one more because we saw the, the probably the clearest. What does this represent? I mean... It's an enormous cylindrical object that they photographed. I think that was Apollo 15. They saw it in space. They took a picture of it. They had no idea what they were seeing. The negative came back. The roll number, the negative number is all there. This object is apparently enormous in size. Let, let me ask you. I've spoken with astronauts. Mm -hmm. Not one of them has said to me, Ken, Ken. Come here, I hey, want to tell you a secret. You haven't spoken that's, to the right one. It's part of the cover-up. Okay. No, wait. <laughs> Let me tell you something about astronauts. Gordon Cooper, three weeks ago, gave the Discovery Channel a full-hour interview. Now, the Canadians came and yes. got Gordon. Gordon Let Cooper me finish, is, for God's sake. Well, Gordon <laughs> Cooper gave Discovery time. a full-hour interview, and he's going to bl blow the whole thing. Now, I've talked talk to Ed Mitchell a month and a half ago. Ed is on the very edge of coming forward and telling what he has seen. Okay, let me, ask, let me ask Robert Schaefer. UFO believer, that's true. But he claims, belief. he claims he has seen UFOs when he was in the military prior to his work with NASA. He does not claim that he saw any UFOs in orbit, nor has any other astronaut said that they have allegedly seen Robert Schaefer, uh, let me, ask you, let me ask you directly. If an astronaut walked in right now, and there's no one behind the curtain, so this isn't a trick question, and said, hey, look, I was on Apollo uh, 12 mission, or Apollo 9, and I have pictures. I took them. I saw it. Would you believe the astronaut? Well, it's, it's a hypothetical question. Okay. What, uh, Give he, me a was, hypothetical was he in answer. Space? Was he in space by himself? Was there someone else on that crew? Yeah. What does the other crew member say? Is there any photograph? Um, I mean, it's, it's great to have this uh, second hand, or we think Gordon Cooper is going to say this, or whatever, but Gordon Cooper has not said he saw anything in space, and neither has any other astronaut. And that thing that we saw could just be an illuminated corn cob or anything else, and there's absolutely nothing to link that to any space mission or NASA or the Japanese Prime Minister or anything else. All right, let me introduce Peter Davenport, whom I'm sure you're pleased to come into the fray here at this point. He is with the National UFO Reporting Center. Uh, located here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, why, because we have more of them here, or what? Well, because it's a good place to live. It's a nice place to have this center. But uh, with regard to this film, I'd like to make a brief comment. I, I'm trained as a scientist. I was born in Missouri, the show-me state. It's a bad combination. I fall in Bob Dean's camp on this. I remain skeptical. It's yet to be proven. But this is a very intriguing film. But there's a great deal of work that has to be done before we can show conclusively that this is legitimate. I might also propose what hasn't been raised yet, and that is the fact that despite the excellent work that I feel Mr. Santilli has done, there's a possibility that even he is an unwitting participant in disinformation. Right, what about the level of Bob, uh, Robert Schaefer's skepticism? Well, it's legitimate. He's raising questions that will have to be answered in the course of a fully-fledged investigation of this film. But I would submit respectfully that his statement flat, categorical, unequivocal statement that this is a hoax is premature for the same reason that it's premature to accept the legitimacy, alleged legitimacy of this film. All right, one, and I'll move on here. Do you get a lot, you, you get a lot of calls from people who see everything from balloons to uh, 1952 Cadillac hubcaps. Um, give me, if you can, a percentage of those that you feel are authentic from sightings here in the Northwest. In the last 15 months, I've taken about Twelve to 15,000 calls, I estimate that approximately maybe 10% in very rough round figures are of legitimate sightings of things that we are to date unable to explain in terrestrial conventional terms. And, and, 10 and I think that's the crux of what we wind up talking about is what we can't explain does that mean we have to accept the alternative? Uh, you know, gullibility and skepticism, there's a fine line between the two, and, and I think it, it's okay to walk it. When we come back, we'll discuss some more of what people say and what we are willing to believe. Stay with us.
Thanks for staying with us. Go ahead, Tommy. Uh, with all the footage and stuff that they have and stuff, will soon they'll have some of the organs and stuff that uh, the public will see? Now, what happened? What happened? I guess what the gentleman's asking here, Ray, is do you know what happened to the uh, remains of the alien? I'm sorry, I don't. Um, I don't think the cameraman knows either. Um, he was just there to film. Marilyn Childs, Regional Director for the Mutual UFO Network, world's largest organization dedicated to this. I, I need your point. UFOs. We haven't got time for the whole thing here. <laughs> okay. Uh, how come we haven't gotten a team of experts all the way from scientists to ufologists, Mr. Santilli, on this project? Uh, question one and question two. We have time for one. Do you, first of all, do you believe the authenticity of his film? I still have the jury out on okay, this. Okay, so you're open. And your question to him is, why not put together a team, Ray? And if you can do that in a real quick second here. I'm not experienced enough to do that. I've given it to the broadcasters to do, and they've done that in every country. All right, when we come back, we'll bring some conclusion to this. I know that, that Bob Dean has some more to say, and Robert Schaefer wants to get uh, yet another lick in on this whole issue. Stay with us. We'll return. Town meeting guests enjoy all the amenities of the Marriott Residence Inn on Lake Union in downtown Seattle. Thank you for staying with us. Mr. Santilli, with the time remaining, and we do have such an abbreviated period left here, uh, there is still the question of why you haven't gone to every length to get this film authenticated. Not copies of the film, but the film itself. Do you feel you've done everything you can and should? As I said earlier, I'm not an expert. I've given it to broadcasters and I've asked them to investigate it. They've got the money and resources to do it. But I with haven't. all due respects, I don't, I don't know if the broadcasters are the ones... I mean, why not submit this to Kodak? Um, it has been submitted to Kodak by the broadcasters. You know, it's not my area of expertise. Okay. I, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with us and, and the, uh, the time discrepancy in Great Britain is, is uh, significant, and I thank you. Uh, Bob okay. Dean, y y your, your final point here. There is something to believe in, is what you say. Well, I have to tell you something, frankly, and I'll try to be brief. The, re the, the reality of this phenomenon does not rise and fall on Mr. Santilli's film. The reality of this phenomenon is based upon an enormous amount of evidence, a body of evidence, and all I say in closing is to you people out there, you have an obligation to inform yourselves. Don't take anybody else's word. Look for the evidence and look for the facts because so help me God, they're there. Okay. All you have to do is look for it. And I, I was gonna ask Robert Schaefer, if, if, this, if this film is in fact at some point confirmed to be authentic, would that then persuade you to accept some of the other extraneous... Well, if, 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 sure, if it's confirmed, but um, I find Mr. Santilli's statement is extremely difficult to accept where he says he's, he's being almost philanthropic about this, he's not making money, he's making, he's making this available for investigation and so on. Common sense tells you that very substantial sums of money are being paid by the broadcasters for these things. If he's serious about having this evaluated, let's give it to scientific organizations for non-destructive testing not give it to broadcasters, give it to, give it to, to some, some scientist at a university, and I'm sure it would not be hard at all to find someone willing to look at this. Please, please join me in thanking Ray Santilli, Bob Dean, and Robert Schaefer for all that they have contributed here this evening. Gentlemen, much appreciation for your uh, contribution. Next week on Town Meeting, a look back over the almost 15 years that Town Meeting has been on the air, the series MASH, for example, 230 weekly episodes. Cheers, something like 280. Town Meeting, well, we've been broadcasting almost 600. Uh, next week, we'll venture into the archives for a look back at the major Northwest issues of the past 15 years and the frequent groundbreaking exploration of those issues on Town Meeting. From the somber to the serendipitous, from those who made us laugh to those who made us afraid, 15 hours of Town Meeting, a retrospective next week. For tickets, give us a call at 443 4186, a look at the Northwest through the eyes of town meeting. And now to the newsroom for a quick update on the day's events.
Hey, I want to thank you for having joined us tonight. I want to invite you also, by the way, you know, we're over there on the Little Old Radio Show on Como AM 1000, 9 to noon, Monday through Friday. Be sure to join me over there. I also ask that you make town meeting a regular part of your Sundays. It is a regular part of mine. Please take care out there, folks. Have a good week.